I feel like ESG has broadly been um, a part of my my entire career, uh, spanning back to actually in high school, this notion that businesses could be a force for good, right? The terms have changed. In college, I studied ethics and corporate responsibility, um, really embracing the concepts of natural capitalism and you know human capital and the, all the different types of capital, not just financial capital, but um, so much of the so much of the philosophy has stayed the same, right? How do you take an expanded view to your stakeholders beyond just the the financial aspect? Um, I helped form the corporate sustainability group at Intel, and then from there, I also looked at how um, all the assets of a corporation could be used to further um, social and environmental um, innovation, justice, et cetera. So really kind of looking at it from a large corporate perspective, a, a thought leader and, and a um, corporation with a significant um, ethical component to it. And now as co-CEO of Second Muse, our whole focus is on how do we build economies that benefit uh, all people and the planet. And so we really believe that our um, economies were built in a somewhat flawed way um, in the past century or so with the notion that um, we don't have to pay attention to the negative externalities. So the, the, the negative environmental impact, um, we've harmed oftentimes humans. We've also made great progress overall as a, as a humankind. So there's, you know, there's an acknowledgement of that, but how do we really use the markets to um, change things and look at uh, how we can address social challenges? and environmental ones. And so that's, we're in the business of doing that. We support entrepreneurs um, all around the globe for this. We engage with corporations, with public entities um, and governments, et cetera. So it's it's really very much of what we do. We are a certified B Corp. And that's one of the things that significantly guides us as well in terms of how to do it. And I'll get into more of that, but I think it's important to not only say we're doing this, we're committed to it, but actually finding mechanisms to go forth and do it. So systems maps, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, go Google um, causal loop systems maps. I'm uh, guessing that a lot of people are familiar with it. It is this notion of how do you take into account an entire system when you're trying to address challenges in that system. And one of the tools that we use, we're members of the Academy for Systemic Change, and we really think broadly about systems and apply systems thinking methodologies. And one of those is using systems maps. And it's, it's really an opportunity for people to build out a map to understand a system. So, you know, Melissa is saying, how, how do people not understand or, you know, please help me guide people in, in understanding the intricacies of the supply chain because they're incredibly complex. And all of our challenges um, related to sustainability are incredibly complex, right? We've gotten into this place because there's lots of different, lots of different dimensions, lots of different organizations, players, issues, et cetera. And developing out a systems map helps people contribute to a map, understand the realities um, through multiple different lenses. I think oftentimes, even those of us with the best intentions come to challenges and view challenges through our own lens, right? And oftentimes those are cyber lenses. And so the intent of us coming together and using a tool like this is to get input from everyone and then actually convene people around this and say, look, there's multiple truths here. And if we're trying to really understand what the barriers are to creating more sustainable systems, um, you know, it's good to understand the big picture. And then from there, um, understanding where are their leverage points? And so where are there different things? Sometimes it's low hanging fruit. Sometimes it's a big aha. I will tell you um, an area and I'll, I'll keep moving on with the food theme, but we were working several years ago to develop out a systems map um, to understand how um, growers could plant more climate resilient maize seed in sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, you know, we had think of all the big players um, across both the public and the private sector are trying, you know, really scratching their heads saying, we don't understand why we can't get this. This is an incredibly important thing to happen. And through doing the, a systems map, literally we're in Washington, DC, and the big aha in the room was, and this is by people who'd been working on this area for, you know, their entire, their entire profession, 20, 30 years, is that um, the markets there are dominated by the informal sector. 
And so if we continue to try to distribute seed through the formal sector, right through distributors, we're not going to um, accelerate the pace of um, more, more climate resilient um, farms, basically. And so this whole idea of like, oh my goodness, a systems map illuminated the need to actually more deeply understand um, understand the challenge and understand, hey, we have to completely change our way of thinking and our way of operating so that we're actually engaging the informal sector more. Um, and from there, you can have business models and new um, areas of entrepreneurship. But, but it's really hard to get um, new business models wrapped around these challenges if you don't actually understand what you're solving for. And it was, it was one of those moments where I'm like, oh my goodness, his, this is the power of a systems map. in terms of really thinking about the opportunities um, around just recycling and in general, how do we think about um, the waste that's being put out? And so I will, I'll give an example. I'll share the share some of the secret sauce ingredients. Um, I don't think they're that secret. I think they, they take patience and intentionality, but um, one of the programs that we work on and really need is called the Incubator Network. And it is focused on how do we eliminate ocean plastic and broadly, how do we reduce um, plastics going into our environment? Um, and we've started out by specifically focusing on Southeast Asia, although the um, intention is to expand that. If you look most broadly at where ocean plastics have accumulated, it is in um, the Southeast Asia region. And so in that case, there's a recognition, a significant recognition just a few years ago um, it was announced at the G7 and, and just more broadly looking at um, how different players need to come together to actually address this challenge, right? Because it's a significant challenge. It's everything from um, the petroleum companies that are, um, you know, providing the raw inputs into different forms of plastics to the design of products to the supply chain um, that uses them to the end, the end um consumers on what do you do with them, right? What do you do with plastic bottles? I mean, we all have them everywhere. It's, it's plastic has, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful product and it's invaded our, um, it's invaded our, our lives and our environment, unfortunately, in ways that are oftentimes not healthy for the environment or for humans. Um, but this recognition that so much of our um, supply chains and our products have actually really been built around that. And so, Part of this is this idea of how do you bring stakeholders together to really address a common thing, recognizing that it's complex. So um, in the case of this, we've partnered with um, many, many different organizations, but our key partner is Circulate Capital, um, which is a venture capital arm and with funders coming in from several of the CPG and oil and gas companies, as well as um, the Circulate Initiative, which is a nonprofit that partners um, with Circulate Capital, but also um, incubators and accelerators all over Southeast Asia that are saying, how do we help entrepreneurs see this as an opportunity? Everything from designing products at the very beginning of this, right? Um, you know, how do you eliminate plastics from um, takeout food, for example, all the way to the end um, in terms of working with municipalities to actually recycle. And then recognizing that throughout this, um, women's lives are often most impacted because they're the ones dealing with plastics. And so I think it's this idea of recognizing, once again, taking a system approach and recognizing what is the role of different organizations in convening them, saying, look, we all have a common goal of reducing um, plastics in our environment, and specifically with those that leak into the ocean. And um, so, so one of the things is just understanding and, and bringing together the different system stakeholders. And we work with so many organizations. Um, we've been working pretty significantly with the World Economic Forum and all of their members at some of our sites um, in Indonesia, specifically in Surabaya. And um, it is this idea that it's also hard. <laughs> so I, I think we never shy away from the fact that it's, it's complicated, it's hard. It takes a lot of time and effort, but the end results are so much better. Um, on, a, on a smaller scale, I think, and on a more intimate scale on partners that you're bringing together, it is oftentimes this like real deep clarity on how we're going to work together, right? And that this is a long-term problem. Because I think sometimes if people say, oh, we're gonna get in and we're just gonna work together for the next year, unless it's a true pilot program and it's well understood, 
um, things don't happen in here, right? We've had a centuries of, of systems that have created these challenges. And so thinking that we're going to solve it. So being very reasonable in what you expect. I think like, how do we partner together and being very intentional about the relationships in which we're forming? How do you exit out of relationships? How do you know when you've had some sort of success? So I think probably the biggest um, item of the secret sauce is patience and intentionality. Intentionality in um, how we engage together. So um, it's, it's, it's very much like, how do you collaborate? And it's, it's, it's hard work, but that's the only way we're going to address a lot of these challenges. So we've been working, NASA is one of our longest term partners slash clients. And we've been working with NASA for almost 15 years. And we started working with them um, really in the innovation space and call it broadly open innovation space. But if you think about um, the International Space Station or the moon or Mars or wherever, um, it is probably the most well-defined understood um, area of circularity, right? For people to live up there, it is a truly circular environment. And so when you start thinking about both the opportunities that NASA has to develop um, new technologies, um, and, and ways of operating um, and bring them into the missions or whether it is saying, hey, there's a whole slew of interesting um, um, ideas, solutions, IP that could be spun out of NASA. It's this idea of how do you collectively come together? And so we started working with NASA in their open innovation space with a program called Launch that was very focused on um, circularity. And then we had partners with USAID, the State Department, Nike, Ikea came into play, um, eBay, we've had so many partners and it's really in, around this idea of um, how do you integrate circularity into things more. So, so yes, NASA, think of NASA, if you hadn't thought of that before, think of it as like the most, uh, the, the mission to Mars is the most cir circular, circular endeavor ever. Um, and as part of that process, um, they're also the largest um, repository of earth sciences data in the world, right? There's several, several satellite companies um, that are doing really good work now that have sprung up, but um, still NASA and its other and the other international um, space agencies have the largest repository. So when we're talking about understanding things, right? It's you know the, the work of WWF or the work of other organizations to say how do we how do we understand um, food loss, right? How do we understand um, our watersheds better? How do we understand all these issues better? Well we do so through data. So um, we've been working with NASA to open up their data sets. They've opened up their data sets as well, but how do you get citizen scientists and people all around the world um, developing solutions to our, our earth and uh, planetary challenges? And so we run the International Space Apps Challenge. We did that this year, it's the 10th year. We helped design it. Um, we have almost 30,000 people, over 160 countries, 10 international space agencies, um, but it's this like, amazing amalgamation and like beautiful thing of people all around the globe saying, hey, we can create solutions using data to better understand, um, preserve, protect, um, and, you know, better utilize our earth resources and explore and explore space. So yeah, it's it's one of those fun things. And when we think about it, that's really the, the early genesis of creating more sustainable economies, right? It's these ideas, it's these partnerships, it's these people coming together and saying, hey, you know, let's solve challenges. So we really see it as, as kind of the, the um, early stages of building new economies. It's these, this ideation and this collaboration. So it's, it's fun too. It's just, I mean, who doesn't get excited about that? <laughs> I think oftentimes it is important to have, you have to have the data, you have to have the metrics. And I think tying it back to actual, um, you know, performance reviews, whatever it is, um, evaluations. But I also think one of the most important things is creating, having those call to ac actions and having clear expectations for all employees, right? Whether you're in a large organization or you're in, um, you know, a small one like myself, right? I, I worked in an organization that was, you know, and I thought about this at the 100,000 level, and now we've got about 100 employees. So, you know, the, the big to the small. And I think oftentimes it is very much creating, um, 
creating the environment and the expectations. So you can say, well, what are the incentives to that? And it's like, well, the incentives are, you know, having a, having a great place to work and having a meaningful and purposeful um, career um, and company. But I do think oftentimes employees want to know how they can contribute. Everyone, right? Obviously, um, managers and leaders are at the high level setting these strategic directions and, and setting the plans. But I think employees want to know as well, like, what, what is my role? Right. What is my role in advancing um, gender equality or racial equality in the workplace? What is my role in um, um, volunteering, for example? What is my role as an employee in um, helping us meet our own sustainability goals? So I really think of it as broadly, you know, set the expectation people, create an, an enabling environment as well, um, and then think about, you know, what else, how do we incentivize? But the first part is creating that environment and the understanding of what's what's expected of people. You have to start, right? Dig in, go fast, learn, learn, learn. Julie said it so well, but I think it's this, uh, it's here, we're going there, we're all going there together. It's a journey. Um, just start. <laughs>